First of all, I would like to thank Patricia Bourré and the organizers of the workshop on mathematical modeling and statistical analysis in neuroscience for inviting Guilherme Hort and myself to be here with you today at the Institut Henri Poincaré. I also wish to acknowledge the support of our funding agencies and that of FAPESP to the Center of Research, Innovation and Diffusion in Neuromathematics, Neuromat. The title of our talk is Retrieving the Structure of Probabilistic Sequences of Auditory Stimuli from EEG. This talk is part of the activities developed within the research project termed the Statistician Brain. According to this conjecture, acting as a statistician, the brain makes predictions about future events in order to interact efficiently in the world. Predicting means anticipating outcomes. The idea that the brain makes predictions so as to anticipate outcomes is by no means new. It goes back to the pioneer work of Hermann von Helmholtz, a 19th century multi-scientist who introduced the notion of unconscious inference. Helmholtz conjectured that inferring about future events should be a crucial mechanism for learning and memory formation. Since then, it has been widely proposed that the brain assigns probabilistic models to samples of stimuli, also called the Helmholtz heritage in the contemporary neuroscience domain. Our goal here is to tackle the following challenge. Does the brain assign probabilistic models to sequences of stimuli so as to act in the world? Take, for instance, a sports person like Fabiana Mure, our Brazilian world champion in pole vault. As stated by Helmholtz, she improved her fantastic skills by training and, and adjusting her models of the reality. But can we transform the sequence of actions performed by this incredible, incredibly skilled person into a mathematically treatable object? and how to approach this question experimentally. A typical solution to this problem in neuroscience is to employ, for instance, simplified sequences of visual stimuli, such as the one depicting a human walk. As shown in this picture, it is possible to put a marker in selected points of the body and then extract only the relevant information that relates to the body movement. We then present to participants videos depicting these point slides while we record their brain signals employing an EEG machine. These EEG signals can be treated so that each recording electrode is considered as a node in a graph of interactions, depicted here as red points and the vertices correspond to interactions between nodes. We then analyze statistically the graph metrics per node, such as distance, degree, etc., and we get very interesting results about how each node behaves in regard to its relatives during the point-like display visualization. Note that there is an ever-changing activity through time across the graphs per participant as depicted here for two repetitions of the same video. However, this approach precludes to retrieve from the recorded brain signals a signature of the employed visual stimuli. In other words, there is no way to establish a formal relationship between the sequence of point-like displays and the graph of interactions. So, at this point with the Neuromat team, we had some open questions how to extract from brain signals the very structure of a sequence of events, how to establish a formal relationship between this sequence of events and the recorded signals. We started to think on a new experimental protocol in which we would provide to the brain a model containing information about the structure of a sequence of events while we recorded the EEG signals. 
we wanted a model that could be described formally so as to retrieve this model from the EEG signal. The chosen model was based on the work of Jorma Hissani, who proposed in 1983 a class of stochastic models capable of compressing any sequence of symbols generated by a source. Hissane introduced a new class of probabilistic models, namely the class of stochastic chains with memory of variable length, also called context-free models. The mathematical formalism and the experimental approach employed in this work is described in this recent publication and will soon be explored in detail by Guilherme. Shortly, volunteers were exposed to sequences of auditory stimuli where they had their EEG signals recorded. Stimuli consisted in strong, weak, and missing hand claps. We employed two different context trees that were called ternary and quaternary. In the ternary sequence, a strong beat was followed by two weak beats And in the quaternary tree, besides, there was a constitutive silent unit separating the two weak bits. In both cases, eventually, the weak bit could be replaced by a silent unit, introducing a variability in the sequence of events. Following Hissonen's proposal, these sequences can be represented by context trees. Given the present symbol, the context tree represents all the possible past sequences with respect to that present unit. The transition probability associated to each context is used to choose the type of auditory stimulus appearing after that context in the sequence of stimuli. When we look at the EEG signal recorded during an experiment, there seems to be not much information across electrodes, as shown here in the right. In the neurophysiology domain, a trick is to repeat the same stimulus, say, a thousand times, and average the corresponding EEG response segments. By doing this, we get an event-related potential. The auditory event-related potential has certain regular temporal features allowing its identification. If a sequence of identical auditory stimuli is followed by a deviant sound or even by the auditory stimulus absence, there is a specific modulation in the EEG signal that is called mismatch negativity response. This marker of novelty discovered in 1978 by Nahatanen and colleagues, has been reported since then by several researchers in the field. Here, the deviant response is depicted in red, as opposed to the response to a standard auditory stimulus depicted in blue. Zero on the X line corresponds to the stimulus onset. The red spot in the brain image in the right shows the location from which the mismatch response was recorded in this participant's brain. In this case, the left auditory cortex. As you will see, the mismatch negativity effect helped somehow to guide our analysis. Hello everyone, my name is Guilherme Ost. And in the next few slides, I will show you how we model the auditory stimuli we consider through context tree models and how we characterize context tree models. To this end, let me start with this simple example. So consider the following deterministic sequence 2, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, etc., where um, the symbol 2 corresponds to a strong bit and the symbol 1 corresponds to a weak bit. Then replace each symbol 1 by a symbol 0, which from now on corresponds to a silent unit, and we do this independently with probability 
0.2, producing, for instance, a random sequence that you see here on the screen. So in this case, it's 2, 1, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 1, 1, etc. This random sequence is an example of what we call in probability theory um, stochastic chain. And the stochastic chain we produce in this way is going to be denoted by x in both phase. And this is a shorthand notation for the whole sequence, which is x0, x1, x2, etc. And in this example, x0 is the symbol 2, x1 is the symbol 1, x2 is the symbol 1 as well, and so on. And by the structure of this auditory stimulus, we call it ternary. Now, let us observe that there is an alternative way of generating the ternary chain X. The chain X can be generated step by step, and this can be done as follows. Suppose we want to generate Xn, given the past Xn minus 1, Xn minus 2, etc. What we do is first we look at less symbol xn minus 1. If xn minus 1 is equal to 2, then xn by the structure of the chain x is going to be 1 with probability 0 0.8 or 0 with probability 0 0.2. Now, if xn is either 1 or 0, then we need to go back one more step in the past. So let's say that at time n minus 2, we have a 2, that is xn minus 2 is equal to 2. Then, by the way we constructed the chain x, we know that xn is going to be 1 with probability 0 0.8 or 0 with probability 0 0.2. Why? So remember, we want to simulate xn, so at time n, we have a question mark. We want to simulate the symbol xn. And in this case, we know that we have observed at time n minus 1, either 1 or a 0. And at time n minus 2, we have observed the symbol 2. So by the first way we constructed the chain x, we know that at time n, we will observe a 1 if we didn't erase the, the deterministic one, and this happens with probability 0 0.8, or we will observe a zero if we replace the deterministic one by a zero, and this happens with probability 0 0.2. The other possibilities for xn minus two is either the symbol one or the symbol zero, and by the structure of the chain x, we know that in this case, xn will be the two, so that's why I have here xn equals two, with probability to one in this case. And we have a, a small drawing here on the right-hand side, just to, to explain this again. So we are at time n, we have a question mark here. We want to simulate xn, and at time n minus one, have observed either one or zero, and the same thing for a time n minus two. So we, observed, we have observed either one or zero. And by the way, we constructed the chain x, we, we know that at every uh, three symbols, we observe a symbol 2. So in this case, we, we, have, we must observe a symbol 2. The algorithm generating x is characterized by two elements. The first one is a partition of the set of all possible sequences of pass units that we denoted tau. And this set tau is uh, the set of the strings 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, and 2. In the partition tau, for example, the string 0, 0 represents the set of all past symbols ending by the ordered pair 0, 0. And to give another example, the string 1, 1 represents the set of all past symbols ending by the ordered pair 1, 1. Following reasoning, the elements of tau will be called from now on contexts. Moreover, the set tau can be represented by a labeled and rooted tree as shown in figure one. As you can see in this tree, the time goes downward. Each level of the tree represented a different time instance. 
Moreover, the leaves of this tree are the contexts of Tao, and this tree representation gives rise to the name context tree. So that's why we call Tao an example of a context tree. In the algorithm generating X, for each sequence of past symbols, the algorithm first identifies the corresponding context, W in Tau. And once the context W is identified, then the algorithm chooses a new symbol A in the set 0, 1, 2, using a transition probability PA given W. In other terms, each context W in Tau defines a probability measure on the set 0, 1, 2. Thus, the family of transition probabilities PAW with A in 0, 1, 2, W in Tau is the second element characterizing the algorithm generating X. The family of transition probabilities associated with Tau are shown in the figure 2 on the right hand side of the screen. And to give you an example, the transition probability indexed by the context 2 is given in the first row of the table appearing in the figure 2. As you can see, P0 given 2, that is the probability of observing a 0 after observing a 2, is going to be 0 0.2. And P1 given 2, that is the probability of observing 1, given that we had observed a 2, is 0 0.8, whereas P of 2 given 2 is going to be 0. That is, the probability of observing a 2 giving a 2 is going to be 0. Okay? So these are the two elements characterizing the algorithm generating the chain X. The ternary chain X is an example of what we call a context tree model. An important feature about context tree models is that the dependence from the past has not a fixed length. Instead, it changes at each step as a function of the past itself. This explains why this class of models are also known as stochastic chains with memory of variable length and variable length Markov chains. The class of context tree models have been introduced by Hissany in 1983 as a universal system of data compression. And very briefly, a context tree model is a stochastic chain characterized by a pair tau p, where tau now is the context tree describing the dependence from the past of the model, and p is the associated family of transition probabilities indexed by the context tree tau of the model. If you want to know more about context tree models and their applications, here we have a few important references. The first is uh, from Hissani with applications to information theory. And then the second one is from Buman and Weiner with applications to DNA data. And then the third is from Galvis et al. with applications to linguistics. And the last one is from Belloni in, in Buzero also with applications to linguistics. We also used another context tree model to generate auditory stimuli in our study called quaternary. The quaternary auditory stimuli is obtained by considering the deterministic sequence 2101, 21012, etc. And then very similarly to what we have done to the ternary auditory stimulus, we replace in a IID way each symbol one by a symbol zero with probability 0 0.2. By studying the algorithm used to generate step-by-step -step the quaternary auditory stimulus, one can check that the corresponding context tree is the one that you see here on the left on the screen, and the family, the associated family of transition probabilities are given in the table that you can see here on the right hand side of the screen. Recall that in the experimental protocol Claudia described before, we have volunteers listening to a sequence of auditory stimuli while 
EEG signals are recorded from their scalp. We have seen so far how we model the sequence of stimuli as context-free models, and now I will explain how we model the EEG signals associated to a given sequence of stochastic stimuli. To this end, let YN be the chunk of EEG signal recorded while a volunteer is exposed to the auditory stimulus XN. For instance, in the image here on the screen, we have an EEG signal of a given electrode. And if you look at the green rectangle, we have that Xn is equal to 2 for a given suitable n. In this case, Yn is the chunk of EEG inside this green rectangle. The time domain of each EEG chunk is 450 milliseconds from minus 50 to 400 milliseconds relative to the onset of the auditory stimulus. The model assumption is the following. The law of Yn depends only on the context W associated to the past Xn, Xn minus 1, etc. According to this assumption, for instance, whenever the context associated to the past Xn, Xn minus 1, etc. is 2, that is, Xn is equal to 2, the law of the EEG chunk Yn is given by a suitable distribution indexed by the context now, if the context associated to Xn, Xn minus 1, etc., is, let's say, to 1, then Yn is chosen according to some distribution, which is going to be indexed by the context to 1, and so on. The EEG signal is then the stochastic process Y, obtained by concatenating the EEG chunks Y0, Y1, Y2, etc., constructed in the the way we just described. From the statistical point of view, one of the main contributions of our work is to present a statistical procedure to estimate a context tree from a sample x0, y0, etc., xn, yn, where x0, x1, xn is a sample of auditory stimuli modeled by a context tree, and y0, etc., yn, are the associated EEG checks. And this can be done as follows. We fix first an integer k larger or equal than one, and we do the following. One, for each symbol a in 0, 1, 2, and string u of size k of symbols in 0, 1, 2, we define the subsample of all EEG checks, y m, such that such that xn minus k is equal to a, xn minus k plus 1 is equal to u1, etc., xn is equal to k. So to give an example, in purple here, we have examples of k equals 2, u is the string 1, 2, and a is the symbol 1. And the rectangles, and the green rectangles corresponds to examples of k equals 2, u equals 1, 2, and a equals 0. In the second step, we do the following. For any pair a and b, we test the new hypothesis that the law of the EEG chunks y, a, u, and y, b, u collected at step 1, not 2, so this is a mistake, are equal. So here there are um, two possibilities. The first one is if the new hypothesis is not rejected for any pair of final symbols A and B, we then conclude that the occurrence of A and B before the string U do not affect the law of the EEG chunks. And in this case, we repeat the procedure with the shorter string U, which is U2, etc., UK. And the second possibility is if the new hypothesis is rejected for at least one pair of final symbols A and B, we conclude that the law of the EEG chunks depend on the entire string AU, and we stop the pruning procedure. In, this, in step three, we keep pruning the sequence U1, UK, until the new hypothesis is rejected for the first time. And in step four, we call tau hat N, the tree constituted 
by the strings which remain after the pruning procedure. An important step in the statistical procedure I just described consists in testing the equality of distributions for two samples of EEG chunks or segments. To this end, we used the projective method proposed by Questas Albertus et al. in 2006. In a few words, the projective method works as follows. First, we choose at random a direction, for example, a burning motion or a burning bridge, and project each function in the samples in this direction. And this produces two new samples of real numbers. And in the step two, we test whether the samples of the projected real numbers have the same law or not. And we can use, for instance, here at this point, the Komogorov Zmirnov test. Under suitable conditions, it has been shown in Questas Albertos et al. that for almost all directions, if the test does not reject the new hypothesis that the projected samples have the same law, then the original samples have the same law as well. The fact that the result holds for almost all directions allows us to repeat step one and two above for several directions. In this case, we decide not to reject the assumption that the two samples of EEG have the same distribution if the number of known rejections of the projected samples over the different directions is sufficiently large. In our paper, we used in each test 5,000 directions and we only rejected the new hypothesis that the distributions are the same if for more than 276 rejections are obtained over the different directions. And we refer to our second paper to the details justifying this choice. After applying the statistical procedure described above, per electrode and per volunteer, we obtained a tree denoted by tau hat n e v. So this is the context tree estimated in the electrode e of volunteer v. And by doing this, we ended up on each electrode e with a set of context trees that we denote tau e n, as you can see here in step one. We then summarize this set of trees in a unique tree called mode context tree, which is defined as follows. We compute the number of times each string W appears as a context in the context trees belonging to the set TEN. The context in the mode context tree, marked in red here in the image on the right hand side, are the nodes that satisfy two properties. The first one is no node in the subtree induced by W has greater value than it. And two, no node in the path from W to the root satisfies the property one. Let me give you an example. In the image displayed on the bottom right of the screen, the string 00, zero belongs to the mode context tree because the nodes 00, 100, and 200, which are the nodes in the subtree induced by the string 00, they appear four times each, whereas the string 00 itself is estimated or appears as a context for 11 volunteers, as indicated in the number in red. And so this is property one. Moreover, the nodes in the path from 00, zero to the root are estimated as a context for no more than four volunteers as, as indicated in the picture. So the string zero was estimated as a context for four context trees, and the root was not estimated as a context for none of the estimated context trees for that electrode. One can check that in this example, the nodes in red are indeed the context of the mode context tree, as we just did for the string 00. Very similarly, one can check that in this example, the nodes appearing in red 
are indeed the contexts of the mode context tree. And we can also see in this example that the mode context tree matches perfectly the context tree of the ternary chain, which was the true stimulus in this case. So here I show the results for the quaternary context tree. This picture shows a sample of results obtained for a given electrode per participant for the quaternary context tree. We had 20 participants in this experiment. You can appreciate that there is some variability across participants. Similar results can be appreciated across participants for the ternary tree. Some variability can be identified across participants. A challenge of this work was how to average these trees across participants per electrode. As detailed by Guilherme, this was solved by estimating a mode context tree per electrode. This is a summary of our main results published recently in scientific reports. Employing the mode approach, we were able to reconstruct a context tree per electrode across participants for the quaternary tree in the left and the ternary tree in the right. Here represented as top views of the score. The color code consists in a distance measure from the original context tree where green corresponds to maximal similarity and pink maximal dissimilarity from the source context tree. As you can see, signals recorded from frontal and left temporal electrodes uh, labeled in green were those who were closest to the original tree. These results are consistent with fMRI studies showing that the prefrontal cortex is involved in learning context-based statistics. So to conclude, we established the formal relationship between the structured sequences of random stimuli and the stochastic process associated to the brain processing of those stimuli. This was done by employing the new functional data statistical selection procedure just described by Guilherme. The obtained results support the conjecture that the brain effectively identifies the context tree characterizing the source. Guilherme and I wish to acknowledge the colleagues that participated in this work. Thank you for your attention.